Uh, okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before we start the panel, there was one, there is one uh, participant, one laureate who wasn't introduced, so I'm going to try a technological way of introducing you. We'll see if that works. If not, I have a few words. So one second. So this is the movie from yesterday's uh, ceremony. My name is Cyrus Chotier, and I work at the Medical Research Council's Laboratories of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. What I work on is understanding the nature of proteins. Proteins are of extreme importance because they're the fundamental material of which organisms are made. And the way they function tells you how organisms work. The good thing about working at LMB is that it gives you a great deal of freedom to investigate problems. One of the most important aspects of this is the invention of the SCOP database. What the SCOP database tells us is how proteins work. We can understand how the atomic groups function and interact. As a scientist, what I enjoy doing is investigating different problems which can be understood by looking at the data you get from examination of, of proteins. Trying to look at the atomic components, the ways in which different atomic components are put together, and the ways in which larger components can then be linked to other components to produce different functions. And solutions to problems is sometimes very difficult and sometimes not, and sometimes very easy. I would investigate things which would become, say, difficult because I couldn't see how they fitted together. In other times, I would see how they fitted together very quickly. You were so sometimes frustrated, and other times, extremely pleased with a sudden insight. And that's how I think science works. Okay, so thanks to the Dan David uh, ceremony tsar. My name is Cyrus Chotier, and I work at the Medical Research... Okay, I guess once is good. So thanks to the Dandavid Ceremony, Tsars Madar Fisher, who gave this, this uh, movie to me on a very short notice. And I'd like to invite uh, David, uh, Cyrus, and uh, Michael to go up here. We'll raise the, the screen. And so the plan is I'll ask some questions, and I also count on the audience to ask questions, okay? So, so think of what you want to ask. It's a unique opportunity. Okay, so uh, yes, congratulations again for winning this, this prize and for your achievements. And I think it's also a nice uh, recognition of the field that, that you know, it was chosen as one of the topics. Uh, I'd like to start with a non, non-scientific work, actually somewhat influenced by, by the pictures that I saw of Mike on the, on the floor. So would you, would you mind telling us a little bit about your own personal history? I mean, you probably not all of you grew up in a farm, but you know, how, you, how you came up to, you know, to where you are. So. Cyrus, would you? Or David? You want a quick? Quick. told by my is it working okay when 
I was at school, what I wanted to do was to be a historian. But I was told by my, my teachers that I couldn't be an historian because I didn't understand foreign languages. My, I had no, and so I went over to chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was a good job too. <laughs> and so later on, after, the, after that, what I happened was that I went, I went to Cambridge. So, I, went, so I, I first went and worked with Peter Paulin for my, for my um, um, for, for, uh, as, as, for my P, 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 PhD, and then I went to then I went on to uh, on to um, Cambridge, and in Ca in Ca Cambridge, I met a, 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 a big group. So, so, so wait, it's a small small group of people who were very interested in the same work as I was doing. M one was Michael Levitt, another one was Joe, Joe Janine from France. And, and so I, w worked the, I worked there for, for, three, three, for three years, and then I went away for some time, and then I went back to Cambridge. Um, in, in, uh, and, and, and And, and, and I've been there ever since. Well, <clears throat> uh, my father was an engineer and mm -hmm. I rebelled against that. So uh, I, I went to uh, art school after high school. I wanted to be an artist. I went to the Academy of Art and lived in Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. Uh, that was in 1971. And then uh, I ended up uh, going to a, a tiny little school for my first two years in college uh, run by um, Sister Corita Kent, who, who was famous for those love posters in the 60s and so forth. Um, she had a kind of an experimental art in school, and I studied psychology there. I got into... Uh, um, Fritz Perl's work and in Gestalt psychology and uh, Carl Rogers' work. Uh, and then I finally decided, well, um, maybe I didn't need to rebel that much. And uh, I switched to the East Coast, uh, again, a very tiny little college, Connecticut College. And I ended up uh, with a math degree and a physics minor. Um, and then after that, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I wandered around Europe for a while and then uh, worked on a farm in California, and then finally decided, okay, I've got to, uh, I'm fascinated about mathematics and, and, and uh, science, and I gotta get back into it. So I, I went, I picked out um, an advisor pre-hand, Andre Ehrenfeucht at the University of California, Boulder, or University of Colorado, Boulder, and I really wanted to work with him. I was interested in logic, and. Uh, you know, Turing's theory of undecidability and so forth. And he, he was a great, great mentor. It took a while to get him to convince, get convinced that I was a worthy student. But um, after that, uh, I went to Santa Cruz. I've been at Santa Cruz for 35 years. Uh, Mike, I want, because you, your early, you, your early past was already discovered. <laughs> you're, you're probably one of the, uh, you know, the people who moved into bioinformatics or before it was bioinformatics, I remember you once hearing you t talking about working with Ulam. So can you talk about yeah, those days sure. a little bit? Yeah, um, there is sort of something else I'd like to add that, uh, you know, and I, obviously I spent my life trying to avoid manual labor. <laughs> and, uh, um, but um, in, in the U.S., uh, Lincoln started uh, the land-grant universities, which were... Uh, pretty much to help agriculture and so on. But, and, and this incredibly um, changed the, uh, the higher, higher education in, in the United States. It distributed it. If there had not been 
a school that I could go to quite cheaply nearby, I, I, would, I would still be there torturing animals. There's no question about it. Uh, so I feel incredibly fortunate that there was this uh, infrastructure around. Um, so my main goal was to find a job that um, wasn't incredibly influenced by the weather and that I didn't have to be out in the rain all the time. Uh, and that was pretty much it. I had no lofty academic ambitions, but I, I discovered that I, I was not, not a bad teacher, and, and so my real goal was just to find a job in a small school that was fairly secure. Uh, so my job search was, when I got my PhD in dynamical systems, was for a university that had no PhD program, because I didn't see the point of that, and that was in the Rocky Mountains where I could go hiking and fishing. Uh, but I had a connection with Los Alamos through, through, my, uh, through my advisor, and I, I went to Los Alamos National Labs in, uh, in the summers when I was in Idaho. Um, and that's where, that's where I met Ulam, and that's, in fact, how, who was an incredibly uh, famous and powerful mathematician who had worked on the Manhattan Project. And he had the idea that there was some math somewhere in this new biology, and he really didn't know what it was. But, uh, and he brought Temple Smith, my collaborator there, and that's really where I got working as a hobby in this se these sequence analysis projects. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I'm, I'm told the, the moderator of such panels should be provocative a bit, and, and it's maybe the next question is dangerous sitting next to David. But uh, so the Human Genome Project, there, was, there were promises that within 10 years it will revolutionize medicine, and I think it didn't, right? So, so once, once, one thing was, was, was there was these just promises to get the money and so on, but, but, but I guess at some point it will, I mean, not just that, but other projects. So could you comment on that? No, the three of you maybe start with David. Yeah, I like to, um, I like to tell the story of uh, speech recognition as an analogy to how technology involves um, I was, before I got into bioinformatics, I was into machine learning and we used to go to the neuroinformation processing systems meetings and uh, I, I remember uh, the speech recognition people saying, well, you know, we've almost got it. Five years, this was like, you know, 19, I don't know, 1990, right? In five years we'll have speech recognition, it will be down, right? And so five years later it comes back and, and, and you tell the same people, it's like, well, you know, you, you don't have speech recognition. No, no, five years, five, you know, next five, guarantee five years, right? So 2000 comes around, there's, there's no speech recognition. You tell them, like, come on, you guys. No, really, five years, five years, we'll have it, right? And this goes on and then suddenly, bam! Siri, and all this, you know, so it's funny. There's, it seems like endless start, and then once it takes off, you know, once engineering gets firing on all cylinders, you see this transformation. So this will happen. It will happen. Mike, in five years. Five years. <laughs> five years. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was certainly a, a lot of a lot of um, overpromising and so on. But I, I think also. Um, people were quite naive about how complicated human biology was. And if you think of it, uh, E. coli, perhaps the most studied organism, uh, until recently anyway, um, we, know, we have good ideas about maybe half, half what half the genes do, and probably we don't have those accurately. Uh, and that's just a little bug, right? So I, I, I think people were over-promising, but also over overly naive about how, how really, really hard human biology was. Okay, the next question. So I, I looked up, before coming, I looked up at Wikipedia, of course. I mean, I guess these days everybody has to say Wikipedia here. Uh, so bioinformatics was termed in 1970, more or less. But I think when it was termed, they, they thought of it just as biophysics or biochemistry. I mean, it wasn't clear that that's, that's it's going to be such a you know such a tight cooperation between biologists and, and, and computer scientists, and uh, and also obviously mathematicians and uh, statisticians. But uh, and I'm sort of wondering what I don't know whether the scientific contents or the sociology of the of the disciplines. I mean, what explains this really 
I think, unique, unique success. Because we don't have, I don't think we have that many success stories of two communities which, on the face of it, are very, I mean, obviously there is, there is a need for that, but also it worked out. So you can point out why. Why bioinformatics worked so nicely and, and not so. Look, um, I mean, modern biology couldn't exist without computing, right? I mean, we couldn't even store the, inf the things David was talking about. You, you could not have the information communicated without computing. So I think necessarily we were, we, with quotes around it, were drug into it. Um, but, but it wasn't. Um, um, I remember uh, a biologist told me, sort of probably in the 80s, uh, if you need statistics to analyze the experiment, you've done the wrong experiment. <laughs> so it's really a resistance to any, any sort of analysis. You know, you just look at it. If the band, if the band isn't big enough, do the, do the right experiment. And that, that, that would, that's pretty silly today, but it, it was quite uh, what held. And I, I think the younger generation of, of biologists and computer scientists are, uh, just don't see these barriers like people my age saw these barriers. Yes, I would say, say the biologists really treat, I think, mathematicians as the people that can do the dirty work for them. <laughs> because they, they, don't have the, they don't have the confidence themselves Trying to, trying to do things mathematically. And I think that's why there have been such a close collaboration between these two groups. And I think, and, and I think that the, the mathematicians, I think, often tend to be very like it. It's a sort of game which, which, made, which they can play very well. No. Okay, uh, and somehow it's along this line. So the worst, I mean, some thoughts and papers ever, even from Ron in this, in this uh, room and then uh, David Watson about how or will computer science, mathematics, I mean, it, it, so far it hardly influenced the, the biology, the pure biology curriculum. It didn't, didn't influence very much. So will it enter there? Will there be a different discipline? How do you see the, the future of that? You know, there are t two young guys we hired. I, I'm in a building where there's a floor of computational biologists who do some experiments, and um, the, uh, the, uh, the other three floors are experimentalists. And the two most recent um, young people we've hired uh, are very well educated in statistics. They want to teach their own bioinformatics course. They're really, uh, they're engaged in this. And it's just, I think it's just part of the air for, uh, for people in this era, so, so I, I, th I think it's really changing. We have, uh, in our department, uh, I think more than half of the faculty have uh, both a wet lab and a computational part to their research, and I, I think we're, and we also, in terms of applicants to our training program, we're in the early days, it was one or the other, and now we're we're uh, we see a remarkable number of dual trained applicants to our to our program. So I think we're getting closer to the integration of the bioinformatics with the actual practice of the science of biology. But are they dual trained in general, mathematics or computer science and biology, or is it yes? Okay, so the bio pure biologists are still pure biologists. There are. There are still pure biologists, there are still pure computer scientists, but there are a number of people that are some weird hybrid that's uh, now populating the field. Okay, uh, my next question is, hasn't given to is, you mentioned a little bit, but uh, I mean, privacy and security issues about these huge uh, data tanks with genomes, but not only genomes. I mean, there will be probably phenotypic information and medical record and what yes. you eat and who your mother was and so on. So, so you know, if, if, if hackers steal my, you know, credit card from some, I don't know, from Amazon, then, you know, it's a pity, but I lose a few hundred dollars or maybe not, but then, and that's it. But if somebody loses, I mean, steals all this information, it might be more, more sensitive. So how do you, I mean, obviously not all, not all details, but 
What do you do about that? Yeah, it's a very good question. And I think we, we certainly want to recruit uh, the, best, uh, the best minds who would love to have you engaged in, in answering these questions uh, as well. Um, there, we, we are trying to find a compromise between the uh, great advantage of making it easy to share data and the uh, danger of having those data be misused. Uh, so part of it is um, basic computer security to try to uh, try to prevent um, and uh, some kind of uh, malicious attack that would that would retrieve data that uh, were supposed to be protected. Um, but another uh, another part of it is thinking about what really needs to be protected and what doesn't need to be protected. And this is the most common part of it. Which if you give too many uh, isolated pieces of information that in and of themselves seem benign, will somebody be able to connect the dots in a way that then becomes dangerous? And that uh, is a very complex problem. Uh, there are certainly mathematical approaches to this. Um, and we're, there have been a number of, of contributions to that, uh, but there are also the, the it's hard to work rigorously because the social dimension of that is still not completely uh, resolved and never will be probably. The new generation is, has kind of a different attitude towards privacy uh, than the older generation. Which may, may make it easier, right? You yeah, that everything on Facebook definitely so. makes it easy uh, in some ways. Um, and we, but we don't understand the kind of inferences uh, you could make from combination of genetic and phenotypic data, yet uh, the, the apps haven't fully been built. Uh, so uh, that, that's the other challenge. So sorry to give such a, a long-winded but inconsequential <laughs> answer, but it's basically a very, very hard problem. Yeah, I, I just recently went to, went to a couple of talks by uh, computer scientists who were worrying about doing um, uh, essentially secret work, but in the cloud. So the issues about both the, the, the results of the computation and the data that was being computed on, and so obviously this is um, you know, some kind of encryption, but the encryption can't be so complicated that it takes longer to encrypt and decrypt than it does to do the work. And it's, it, listening, you know, I was um, really thought this, this was, there were, there were interesting talks, and the, the motive in the discussions is pretty much exactly the same as we're worrying about with, with genetic data and privacy. So I, th I think the whole sis modern society is, ha has to come to grips with this. But you know, another issue really is how, 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 much, how much privacy do we really need? I, I mean, G George Church's genome is online. Right. Absolutely, but, but not his, uh, not the record of his no, disease. But, but, not, but not, not, not his doctor's record. That's that's right. But I, I think his, so, I think his social security number is also online. So it's, it's, it's actually, actually a lot of George's, uh, George's uh, medical information is also online. He's not very secretive uh, about that either. I, if you, if you see him nodding off. At a at a conference, it's, uh, it is the narcolepsy that he's declared is definitely one of the medical conditions that he has. So you're saying maybe the maybe the answer is we should just not worry. Well, if you're if you're George, right? You just uh, you know what the hell? There is no privacy. Deal with it. <laughs> I just want to sh mention maybe for the benefit of the audience that the uh, work done by Yaniv Ehrlich and Rand Halperin from here. They show that if you put your, I mean, anonymity, anonymity by itself is not the answer. If you put your, don't know, Y chromosome on the web, just with high probability or with non-negative probability, some relative of yours has also put his chromosome on the web, and you could find out, I mean, anybody could find out your, your family name or where, more or less where you live and so on. So, so very naive things are not going to work. So it's obviously complicated. Okay. But I would contend that I think secrecy is too, too, too 
closely guarded now. I would thought that you, you should, everything should be free unless they can demonstrate clearly that it would be a, a, a disadvantage to some individual. And if, if it was, if, in, 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 and, in, and the individual would have to say why they would, can't, can't, can't cope. Well, I don't know, if they put my gene online and there is some mutation which says, you know, I'll go nuts in two years, then maybe, maybe Tel Aviv University will want to fire me or something. So, and, and maybe I don't know that, but it will be revealed later, so it's... No, but they, they wouldn't be allowed to fire you. They would not be. Eh, but then... No, not, not, not fire you because... <laughs> not fire you because of, because of, because of, 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 of that. Uh, but anyway, anyway, but anyway, but, 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 but at the moment is now, I think there's a lot of lot of things which, which people are quite wanting to hide, either because they want the money, probably because they want the money, or because they think that, 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 that there's some, somehow that, that they, they will be uh, uh, discovered for, for other other purposes. Well, one of the things to that's going to change dramatically as we get more genomes available is that we go from a world in which everyone's genome has an enormous amount of information that isn't really, it, that's, that's distinct to their family or their close relatives and hasn't already been revealed by somebody else's genome into a world in which most of the information is already out there from similar people who have given up their genomes. So uh, one of the fascinating things that's happened recently is uh, Yaniv Ehrlich at the uh, New York Genome Center has managed to construct a pedigree with more than a million people in it. Um, and this is based on a combination of genealogy information and genetic matching. So they're there, we are actually, um, you know, one species, uh, and, and so we share an enormous amount of our DNA, and we, you can impute a lot of the information, um, and you get better and better at imputing that the more DNA that's out there and the more that uh, of this shared. So it's, it's not like us. Unfortunately, our genomes aren't a secret just about ourselves. We can't say, okay, I'm going to keep all the information about my genome secret because if our brother <laughs> or our sister <laughs> gets their genome sequenced and, and, and reveals that information, that's, our, that's already a substantial amount of our, and even now with distant relatives through this incredible complex chain of inferences, one can find out information. So it's there is, that's a definitely a changed version of privacy. So maybe it's time for the audience to ask it. Rui? So I have a related question. Uh, besides the privacy impl implications, uh, how do you imagine things will change? How, what do you think the effect will be of uh, really ubiquitous sequencing where I can take my iPhone or whatever and uh, sequence my food or, yes. uh, and let's say where you can ignore the technical difficulties of noisy sequencing or whatever. Say you have perfect recall and I can sequence myself every day. I can sequence my food. How will it change society? What will it be useful for, et cetera? It's, yeah, it's exciting to think about that world. Um, since we talked about George Church, my, my Famous, my favorite comment of his is, yeah, well, someday I'll have a sequencing machine sewn into the fabric of my shirt and I'll be walking down the street in New York sequencing everybody. <laughs> I, every time I'm on a plane and someone coughs on me, I definitely want to have that shirt that sequences it and know the hell, what the hell I just got exposed to. Uh, I think, yeah, I think, uh, it is, it, it's an amazing uh, possibility that we could we could have an enormous amount of molecular information about what what our world is and what we are and how how we're interacting with it, and and that combined with the internet is is an awesome shift in thinking about what we we can and can't do. Um, I think I think there will be 
uh, a huge number of applications that are that are uh, a, as yet hard to imagine. But uh, most of these things involve um, having things that are more reliable and more sure. Uh, so sequencing food to find out what it if it is what it claims to be or not is is a great thing. I mean uh, uh, that creates a whole new level of accuracy in dealing with our world. Uh, and and uh, for those who have autoimmune reactions, even from simple allerg allergies, you know, knowing precisely what, what you're exposed to there, that's another issue. Um, so um, it's, it's still the complexity, I think, that Mike alluded to of making the connection to what that actually means for things that we care about. Uh, that's still going to take an enormous amount of time because of the enormous complexity of connecting genotype to phenotype. I was reminded, listening to David, that uh, there's this, uh, or a couple, I guess a couple of, uh, of studies where uh, people uh, went to sushi bars and took samples of the, of the fish and uh, ended up that I think half of them were some other some other species of fish than was labeled by the by the sushi bar. So there's there's some consumer benefit from this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Rui, can you pass the ah. mic? Thanks. So I want to ask two questions, which actually deal with the social, not with the scientific. The first question is, do you think that there should be areas or elements or subfields in which there should be a prohibition or at least a stoppage or temporary stoppage of research until the social, legal, and ethical issues are in one way or another sorted out, like, for example, the recent work on human embryos? That's the first question. The second question is, again, about the social and sharing and privacy. Because if you think, um, not sort of in the abstract, about sharing and, and openness and privacy, but you think about particular regimes, economic and, and the political regimes, and then you think about what would happen if for example, people were distributed into subgroups according to certain mutations and they would become biosocial subgroups that would then be incapacitated in health problems, work problems, etc. So it's not, it's not just the social in the abstract, but particular issues that have to be sorted out before you can actually share whatever you want to share. So first, yes, it's time to um, call a, uh, a moratorium on, official moratorium on uh, germline genome editing. I, I fully am in accord with the recent papers in Nature and, uh, and other venues on that. Um, the, the Chinese group that went ahead, I think, had the intention of demonstrating that it was dangerous. Uh, so, uh, oh, yes, okay, so opening this up uh, a bit. Um, so there, there is a new technology uh, called CRISPR-Cas9. It is a, uh, a much, much more efficient way of actually uh, making an edit, so a small change uh, to a genome of a, a, say, human embryonic stem cell uh, or... Um, even a, um, uh, a cell from an earlier, an early zygote, uh, in principle. Um, but in practice, it's it's incredibly useful for embryonic stem cell research. So we can actually simulate the mutations that we would like to study, and then differentiate those cells. Um, the application of that to actually uh, changing a human genome and raising uh, the, the child would be a tantamount to cloning, uh, which was a similar, uh, there was a similar discussion and we have a similar international agreement that we're, we don't want to go that route. 
at this point. Uh, I think this discussion is going to be prolonged uh, because there, you know, there are cases uh, where you know one can imagine that one one uh, it would be to the to the benefit of the child and 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 so forth to make some of these changes. So this is going to be a prolonged discussion. It's not an obvious or cut and dried issue, but it is a very deep issue and calls for a moratorium at this point. Um, the second point is in terms of. Uh, societies are that might stigmatize based on knowledge of genetic content. So there, uh, this is always an issue. Um, the one of the things that uh, balances that is that um, the actual your actual uh, phenotype and what you what you have do what you what you're uh, able to accomplish what you've done so far is. Uh, much better predictor than than the genome, unfortunately. So, people say, um, well, people will be stigmatized because there's something in this in their genome that that makes them uh, predisposed to violent behavior. Well, that's a very weak indicator of violent behavior compared to whether you've been violent for the first uh, 12 years of your life. I mean, that, that is much much more correlated. Uh, with the chance that you will still be violent later on, and so we're, you, you know, you have to be realistic about some of these, uh, some of these cases in which um, you're you're imagining that what is actually a very very weak correlate would somehow be taken as gospel. That's clearly a mistake, um, but I think people won't be discriminated against. Any more than they already, you know, are discriminated against based on actual visible things that we've we've been aware of all the time, right? So it's it's the same kind of problem, and genetics, in a sense, doesn't change that. It adds more variables, and but in many cases they're very weaker variables. They're weaker weaker correlates, and so it would be silly to discriminate more on those than one would discriminate on the stronger correlates that we already have. Okay, any more questions? Uh, Hi. Um, this is a semi-pragmatic, semi-philosophical question. How has your journey as a scientist in this field has influenced your perception of the boundaries of knowledge? I mean, how much do you think we could know, and how much do you feel we should know? You know, um, you can give answers to that question, but human beings just can't stop trying to learn new things. Uh, so um, it, it's you know it's it's very difficult to fence off some area and say we're 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 not we're not going to learn anything about that. Even even when there's potential for evil to to happen, um, people are going to invent gunpowder and. Bullets, and we, we're just going to have to deal with this. Hello. Uh, I got the impression that uh, many bioinformaticians have never worked with uh, pure biologists and vice versa, and uh, sometimes even have uh, prejudice about one another. And, um, do you think there is some kind of inhibition of these kind of collaborations, and uh, how how could there uh, there be more uh, encouraged collaborations between between the two? My, my answer for this is is students groups where both flavors of students are together, uh, going going to a few talks, having pizza, and uh, the, the students teach each other ama am amazing things. So if you silo them off and you have the computer science students in one tower and all the experimental biologists in another tower, uh, there's, it's just going to be hard to, to create uh, cr cross, cross talk until you, until you mix the, the students. Being a little provocative, uh, you, you were talking about hiring uh, new postdocs. Why would a postdoc go to a lab where he is about to publish five papers on each 30 or 40 authors? 
how, how would he get the, the credit? Uh, yeah, that's actually been a... I'm talking about the, the practice of the... Absolutely. Yes, I think this has been a major problem uh, with these large collaborative projects that you, you become uh, one of a, uh, several hundred names on, on a paper and as a young uh, postdoc trying to um, make a, uh, a reputation for yourselves, those are just discounted. Uh, they're, they're, they, uh, they're just passed over in many cases in terms of review, uh, do I want to hire this person? Um, and uh, part of that, just the practical solution is I always advise my postdocs to be involved in some of these large collaborative products for, projects for the experience and for the great connection. So you actually get to know, you directly interact and you, and you show your results to famous professors at many different institutions. You become uh, a known quantity, a name, and so forth. So that re it really does still help. Uh, the student to be involved in these big international projects. Uh, and, and in fact, our students, we have so many projects going on at, this, at, the, t at the same time, and everyone has a weekly call, you know, tele I mean, I just teleconferenced out. I just can't stand one more teleconference. So I'll put the postdoc in charge of the teleconference. So this is, you know, the postdoc is representing our entire project and our entire university presenting slides or PowerPoint. So that's actually good. But when it comes to looking at the CV, uh, that's bad. And so I always say that you need to do what's now in the vernacular called a satellite paper. So the big paper comes out in nature, but then you have a special contribution that you've made to that paper. It gets maybe one or two lines of text in the big summary paper, but then you write your own separate paper, your first author, and you're describing in depth what you did on the project. And that's very important to get those sat first author satellite papers out. That leads to another question of the, on, the, on the same line. Uh, say 10 years from now, how much of the bioinformatics will be done in companies versus uh, academic institutions? Um, for papers which come, I give published with stu students. When they when they first come, they, they 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 come at the end of the paper. Once once they once they've do do very good work, I put myself at the end of the paper, which means that they and, and which, which means that they get that they get the credit. Because they look, because the first author is seen at the beginning of the paper, and I'm and I'm, I'm at the end, and so I think what 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 I do is, so so so, I, if, if what, this 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 means that they get they get they get a good. Um, um, Set, set, set of people look at reading about mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So I think you, because the, 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 position, the position of where you are on papers is, that, is, is, is very important. And so, and, 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 and that's why I, 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 I swap, swap places to, 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 to try and make sure that those good, very good students can, can, can be seen to be very good. Companies versus universities? You know, I think companies are going to be doing more bioinformatics than they have in the past. Uh, certainly, uh, you see what? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So I, you know, I think this is this is a trend. Uh, we'll we'll see a lot more um, companies contributing to bioinformatics. Than, than in the past. First of all, thanks for this great discussion. Um, I'd like to make a quick comment about the previous comment, um, which is that github.com has some really great uh, graphs for measuring contributions. 
and it's not linear. You get yeah. to see what people have actually done. It's really neat. Uh, my actual question uh, is, uh, there's been some discussion about the field, and I wonder if you have any uh, comparisons uh, or, or contrast with uh, sort of what happened uh, six years ago with biochemistry and how there was a field of biology and then these physicists and these chemists came along and they revolutionized everything and now we are in that world and I wonder maybe you have some comments about sort of the, the super big picture. Uh, just before we get into bio, the biochemistry analogy, thank you so much for the GitHub. Uh, that is so important. And, and so an, another way is really emerging in bioinformatics and in many other fields to get recognition, which is to contribute to one of these large open source product, projects, which is tracked on GitHub. And especially if you're looking for an industry job, this is very, very serious cred. In, ap in academics, it's, ah, well, how many first author papers and so forth. But seriously, your contribution to open source, which is well tracked in these, is huge. And it's a great way to make a name for yourself. Anybody else want to take the other question? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's a great analogy. Um, you know, uh, a new field emerges when, when uh, you have just uh, an opening of possibilities that require uh, a, a integrated way of looking at things that that is, that is contributions from multiple previous fields, and I think we're, we're experiencing that. One last question. What about a non-linearity and many uh, body problem that are still globally in science are, are unsolved problems? I mean, the, most of the problem for uh, getting up from the un, human, many of the problem from getting up from the draft of the human genome project to uh, the phenotype are, uh, are come from uh, interaction between the genes and the interaction between gene and environment, and many of these interactions are non-linear, so there are, uh, there are huge problem in science with the, to solve a non-linear problem. It's not, not, I think not an easy question to answer. Um, uh, you know, obviously, there are very, very nonlinear problems. There are components, uh, critical components, that we have no idea of their existence. There are um, molecules we don't know about yet. Uh, this is, it's, it's hugely complicated, and it's, this is not quickly solved in any way. I, I, so th there's, a, there's a huge future for everybody moving into this field. Yeah, there, there is an enormous amount to do there. Um, just, the, just the linear approximation has so many variables in it that we don't understand the eigenspace structure and uh, all, of the, 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 uh, all of the nice things that you think about with linear systems are already scaled to the point where they, they themselves are difficult, setting aside the nonlinear aspects uh, of the problem. So it's a huge, the systems theory of how the cell works is a huge, problem, yes. A very short story and the uh, question that uh, demonstrates my ignorance more than anything else. The story goes like that. In the late 60s, there was a series of papers in Journal of the American Chemical Society by a fellow from Caltech in which he declared that this, the, whatever he had discovered, was the key to the understanding of the genetic mutations. 
Those were the words. He had to write an errata later on. The question is, do we understand? Is there a key to the understanding of genetic mutations? If there is, it's not simple. <laughs> is there anything in common to all the inducers, to, to, to all the ways that cancer is being induced? Uh, no, it's one damn thing or another. <laughs> to first approximation, unfortunately. Okay, so I think it's obvious whoever was hoping that all cancer or bioinformatics or biology problems will be solved in this session is disappointed, but I hope that you got some interesting things to think about. So I'd like to thank the audience for the questions and uh, David, uh, Cyrus, and Michael for the answers and the talks. Thank you very much. Thank you.